Good morning, everyone. Larry Williams. I've been looking forward to this for a week to get back to you to update you with what I've been looking at and seeing in the markets. As always, I'd like to start with what I call the unknown great growth stocks. I pointed out several stocks to you uh, over the last uh, four weeks that very few people have heard of that have amazing track records. And I want to show you another one. This has been a favorite stock of mine for, oh gosh, maybe 15 years now. Here's a chart of it. As you can see, it's one of those stocks that really doesn't know how to go down. It can go into a trading range, but it just goes higher and higher. We're talking about fast and all. Symbol is F-A-S-T. This started as just a small storefront business, if you can imagine that. And of all places, Winona, Minnesota. They went from that to over 2,600 worldwide offices. It's a really low-tech company. They distribute metal fasteners. Hip, hip, hooray. It sounds like nothing, right? The supplies and they machine various parts. So this is like about as low tech as you can get. But as you can see, it's been an incredibly successful stock. And there's some reasons why they've been successful. You may have even seen the brand name uh, around the country a little bit. You'll probably recognize it more now as you see it in the future. Uh, they have solutions. You can see they have vending machines. How high tech is that to sell stuff out of vending machines? Um, but that's what they do. The stock price has gone up. 43,000% since 1987. The S&P, it's gone up about 630%. So you can see an exponential difference in the fast and all performance versus the overall stock market average. And again, this is a stock very few people are aware of. Here's the secret of this company. The company was founded by a guy who was, billed himself as the cheapest CEO in America. His desk is an old door on top of cinder blocks. Um, they have very little debt, almost no debt. Uh, the executives drive to meetings. They don't fly to meetings. They eat at a and They share motel rooms. Uh, the, uh, the executives got the first pay cuts in the recession in 2008 hit. Uh, they run a really tight uh, uh, financial uh, company. And the president, who's retired now, but has been taken over by a friend of his who's similarly inclined, Says, look, we'll make our money in in stock. We're not going to make our money out of a salary. I think he was a, the lowest paid CEO of any S and P 500 company because I'm going to make the money off the stock if the stock does well. So they really have watched their expenses, and that's one reason for their success. They do pay a dividend, which is unusual for stocks with this type of performance. About a 2.5 percent dividend. Debt to equity 0.17. You see, Microsoft is 0.77. IBM. 4.1, Dow is 1.1, Dow Chemical. The PE is not terribly high, coming in at 27.4. Earnings per share, uh, last uh, the next five years is projected to be out 19%. So they do have potential growth still coming in the, com in the company. And I think we're going to see that the growth uh, continued in the future. So there's what we see, that there should be a good future for Fastenal. But where are we right here, right now? I always like to look at that. Here's a seasonal pattern for fast and all. It's already begun the typical seasonal rally that starts about this time of year. You can see the seasonal rally right here, which says there's plenty of breathing room left in this market until into early 2020, we should expect to see higher prices. Um, I like to look at professional buying in the marketplace. The professionals have recently moved a little bit to the sell side. They're aggressively long here as they were over here professionals are heavy buyers here and back here each time the stock rallied that's bullish uh, so right now we're probably going to see the market consolidate a little bit and then get into buy area we can kind of fine tune that a little bit if we look at um, the cycle forecast i've done the cycle forecast for fast and all suggests we do have a pullback into about the middle of November, and then we can start that seasonal rally again to the upside. So right now, yeah, you bet it's overbought in the marketplace. I'd like to be a buyer of it when it gets oversold. Uh, what I really like to do in these little known great, great growth stocks is when there's a lot of weakness in the market, step in and be a buyer. That seems to be the best time to be a buyer in these stocks. And so I'd look for that in fast and all. Uh, great long-term growth company. Again, this is a stock I followed for maybe 10, 15 years now, and it just has always been a phenomenal long-term great growth stock. I'm happy to present it to you. I'd like to talk about some what I think are really shocking facts of trading. 
we have the same number of losing traders now as 50 years ago. Isn't that interesting? A new study came out, uh, the, still about 85% of traders don't make money doing this. Now, this is really interesting to me because we have a lot lower commissions now. When I started trading stocks in 1962, you paid a percentage of the transaction, not a flat fee. And then it was like maybe $100 a trade. And then it got to $45 to trade. And that's just a few dollars to trade. So we have a lower cost of business. We have much faster flow of news now than we did back then. We'd have to wait. I live in California, in Carmel, California. At the time, we had to wait a couple of days to get to Wall Street Journal. Um, we have much faster order fills now. You would have to call your broker, place the order, see if you got filled. And now, click, you're filled. We have a lot of new and improved indicators, and we now have computer knowledge, which we didn't have in the 60s and the 70s, or even in the early 80s, but still the same number of losing traders. Isn't that interesting? What does that tell us, and how can we change that more importantly? Well, to me, the conclusions are technical analysis probably doesn't work, or we need to get different indicators and tools. And really the bottom line here, and this is an interesting one, is to be successful, just do the opposite of what you've been doing. If you would have sold when you bought or bought when you sold, most traders would have made money. So that tells me the driving force behind trading success is largely emotions. Your emotions are overriding your analysis. Well, it's contest time, by the way. Uh, we do this every week. We give a free two-month subscription to my uh, weekly market commentaries. And I got a great question for you coming up. The first person who will type in the correct answer in this question box wins. So get ready to do this. I'm going to ask the question in just a moment. And here comes the question. This is an interesting one with a lot of ramifications to it. What S&P 500 stock is the largest gainer so far in 2019? And at least make a pretty close estimate by what percentage point? And there's a lesson here. You're going to really enjoy it. We're going to have another a contest in the second half of this show, and we'll have a question that will fit back into this. So if, we'll see if we can get a winner. The first person to type in what S&P stock has the largest gainer in 2019 and by about what percentage point. So I want to go over this. Where's the money? Where are the best odds for short-term trading success? Day trading, stocks, futures, Forex, options? I mean, after all, Forex and options have the potential biggest bang for your buck because you put up the least amount of money. Stocks, probably not as much because you have to put up the most amount of money, even on margin. But where is the money? Or as Tom Cruise said, show me the money. And I'd like to show you the money today. I think we're going to be able to do that. Um, it's pretty interesting to me where the money really is in trading. Where the money really is in trading uh, it's not conjecture. This is real time, real traders, real results give us the answer to this. And here it is, where the money is. We looked at the World Cup trading championships through uh, October of this year. Notice the uh, futures trading people are up 225%. The Forex traders up 82%. The second place and the futures traders up 164%. The second place in Forex traders up 68%. Check this out. The fifth place in futures trading is up more than the first place in Forex trading. Is there a message there? Probably so. In fact, if we go back and looked at the uh, 2018 World Cup final champions, uh, one of my students, uh, Petra from Czech Republic, was up 257%, more than the first place in Forex trading. The uh, fifth place in Forex is up 23%. Um, the fifth place in futures trading is, uh, would have taken third place in Forex trading. Guess what? There's more opportunity in futures trading than Forex trading. And if we look through, and you can do this, you can go to their website and look up all this stuff as well. When we do this, we see that, in fact, uh, futures trader in 2018 up 257 Forex up 200%. 2017, futures up 217%. Forex up 103%. 2016, futures up 914%. Forex up 156%. Hey, is there a lesson there? Futures in 2015 up 309%. Forex up 107%. And this has been consistent through all of the data that you look at 
the Forex guys, the futures guys do better than the Forex guys. Futures guys consistently up 250%, Forex up 104%. 2006, futures up 100%, Forex up 18%. What a difference. If we look at the all-time record growth, in fact, in all these trading championships, uh, interesting thing, my daughter Michelle has the second largest gain trading futures up 1,000% in 1997. And of course, uh, my big deal in 2000, in 1987 was to be up 11,000%, taking $10,000, so a little over $1.1 million. But the big lesson here, the big lesson is the money is in uh, futures for short-term traders. So we have an answer to our contest, which has been the greatest growth stock of 2019, and it's been Chipotle Mexican Grill. They're up 97% so far in 2019. Now, this is a low-tech company, another low-tech company. Isn't that interesting? Uh, this is a company that uh, a year ago, people had written off the books. They thought it was all over. This company was going no place. And in actuality, it's been the best gain stock of the entire S&P 500, um, telling us that there's a lot of stuff going on um, in these markets. And we really want to pay attention to low stock, uh, low uh, high tech, I'm sorry, low tech companies, because there's been some very successful ones. The question is right now with data like this, do you want to be a buyer of Chipotle Mexican Grill right now? Well, let's take a look. Here is the cycle forecast uh, for Chipotle Mexican Grill that I've done. You see, it says we should come down into December. So do I want to be a buyer right here, right now? No, this market has been substantially overbought. But come the middle of December, I would want to be looking at this market for a potential rally. So uh, just because the stock has been real strong doesn't mean we're going to rush in and buy it. We still want to be careful and expeditious in our entry into the marketplace. But considering that this has been the biggest winner yeah, so far this year, I think has a real message for us to, to think about low-tech stocks. And something like Chipotle Mexican Grill, one of the all-time great stocks have been a couple, well, Starbucks. Uh, you know, it's a coffee shop, right? Not much high-tech stuff there. Uh, some of the pizza chains, uh, amazing the amount of money that's been made in retail and service because America's changed from manufacturing company, country, from manufacturing to service industries. And that's where a lot of people get off and trying to figure the economy right now. Our manufacturing numbers are really miserable because we're not doing it. Other countries are doing it, but our service industry numbers have still showed a, a whole lot of growth. I want to focus one more time on this idea of where the money is. We'll go back even to the Tom Cruise picture of show me the money, because this is so critical. Most of you are short-term traders and you're trying to trade options or stocks or futures or Forex. And there's a lot of people telling you out there what really works, but we know from um, real data, Real traders, these are people that are pretty experienced. They are in trading contests. So these are good traders. And where do good traders do the best consistently has not been in Forex trading. It's consistently been in the futures markets. Now, if you're not a futures guy, you're a stock guy, you can still do the same here by trading in um, uh, ETFs for futures. But where the money is, clearly, uh, We'll get back to it again. Clearly is in the future market. So I'm going to break in just a moment here. We're going to come back. and I'm going to have my future forecast for the stock market and some individual trades coming up. So we're going to take a break right now. I'll be back shortly. Where are we going in the future? This is Larry Williams. Welcome back. I'd like to show you what I think is going to be happening in stock prices. Get ready. There's a lot to happen. I'm going to also review trades that I've shown the last couple of weeks and some new trades for you. So let's do it. I think we're going to see new highs in the S&P 500 in the stock market, and here's why. Pretty simple. The blue line is the really critical advanced decline line. It is actually at new highs, isn't it? Look at that. Prices have not made new highs. Well, price follows the advanced decline line. Notice the advanced decline line broke out here before stocks. Advanced decline line broke out here before stocks made a new high. I think this will happen again. So it's a great measure of internal market strength. We call it market breadth. I've been following this since 1962. I know a lot about this index. And it tends to lead prices 
and leave prices out of big congestion zones like we've seen here. So I'm telling you, get ready for new market highs. That's also confirmed by an indicator I developed quite a few years ago where I combine price, volume, and open interest all into one measure of accumulation. That is also broken to a new high. And that also tends to be a, a harbinger of what price will do. In other words, these internal measures, kind of an X-ray view of what's really going on in the marketplace, the foundation of price, if you will, is a leading indicator. Notice in this area, while price was hanging out in the same lows, we're getting good accumulation coming in the marketplace and price breaks out to a new high. So I think we're ready for new highs in the market. So just hold on, which would perhaps suggest a year-end rally. And I think, oh, absolutely, ladies and gentlemen, guys and gals, we are going to see a year-end rally. In terms of timing, using the cycles that I do, it looks like the next really big move starts about October 28th, right at the end of this month, maybe the 25th. Some, but we're really close to that now. And reading cycles, remember cycles say a buy point here, a buy point here, a buy point here, one over here, a year-end rally. It doesn't tell us the magnitude of the move. The stagnation that we've seen in the S&Ps the last seven, eight trading days, just a cycle saying we're not ready yet, but get ready about the end of this month. I think we're going to see this market move substantially to the upside and we continue to make new highs in the market. So that's my view of stocks of what we should expect to happen in in the stock market, very bullish, which means you buy big dips in the market, hold on as long as you can, hard to hold on to trades or sell and take profits on big rallies in the market. Because imagine if we break out above this one, two, kind of a triple top in here, oh my gosh, will buying come in? Oh yeah, you bet, massive amounts. So get ready for a breakout to the upside. Okay, let's look at some potential trades, trades we've had and trades that I think are coming up in the market. Swiss franc, a little follow up on the Swiss franc. We talked about that last week. We thought Swiss franc would move higher because we can look at Swiss francs have a strong relationship to interest rates and that forecast suggests we should move to the upside. Swiss franc has followed interest rate forecasts pretty well. This is not based on technicals now. This is based on real relationship between interest rates and the Swiss franc. We also saw the commercials were buying, and they tend to be pretty good in the Swiss franc when commercials, those in this case would be banks and the governments are buying that currency, it tends to rally. Our cycle forecast was also suggesting a rally somewhere between now and the end of uh, October, so all the elements are starting to fit into place. Problem though with the trade, there's always problems with the trade, right? Kind of an update on the trade. Uh, we did have this is when we were bullish on it last week. It's broken out to the upside. The problem is a seasonal pattern is to the downside until a little later in November. Trend of momentum is measured by the blue line. It's kind of flat in here, not doing much. But percent R, my overbought, oversold indicator, is in the buy zone. So I think another entry getting above the highest high of the last two days would probably suggest that this market, which has had a nice up move following our bullishness, a pullback, and a continuation of that market moving to the upside. Gold. We've talked a lot about gold here. You know, this gold traders, I know some of you are gold bugs and proud of it, but gold is a commodity and that's a it. Uh, in fact, if you look at when we've seen big crashes in the market, like the crash of 2008, gold went down. The crash of 1987, gold went down. The crash of 1929, gold didn't rally. A lot of people have this misconception that when we have the big one, recession, market decline, whatever, gold will take off. No, gold tends to actually be much stronger in times of inflation or when the commercials are buying. I mean, after all, this is a commodity that, that people use. The commercials are the red line you see down here, and when it's very high, they've been net, they were net long gold here, and gold took off. They were buying gold over here, gold took off. They were buying over here, gold rallied. Currently, they've been very negative on gold as they were back here and over here. So this is a market just like you know, wheat or corn that's driven by fundamentals in the marketplace. Fundamentally, right now, we see the seasonal cycle is to the downside. Oh, that's interesting. Commercials are negative, seasonals move to the downside, and I have a model to tell us if gold is overvalued or undervalued. It was 
undervalued in this area, overvalued here, undervalued back here. Another fundamental measure in it's telling us gold is in the overvalued zone. So we have a market that's overvalued, commercial selling, seasonal pattern to decline. Obviously, I'm looking for sales in this market. And I like to confirm that or back that up, though, with cycles. We look at my cycle forecast and it says we should continue moving down till about the second week of November. So I think we can still see some pressure on this market. In terms of where we are right now, technically speaking, we're in a big like triangle here. Two points. Our accumulation line has already started to blow, break below that accumulation line, trend line, which is negative. But the vector of these two lines from the triangle meet on October 31st. I would expect some really big action on that day. Whenever you see a triangle, just get the uh, ascending lines, uh, descending lines, the ascending lines, and where those points touch, you kind of get a hot spot on the market. So you can watch that. We'll be watching that as the weeks progress here. Okay, contest time. Another contest. We'll give another two-month free subscription to my uh, Larry TV weekly market commentaries. First person to type in the answer is the winner. And the question is, what stock in the S&P 500 is the largest loser in 2019 and by about what percentage? Very interesting. We looked at the largest gainer in the S&P 500, Chipotle Mexican Grill. Now, what stock is the largest loser? Hmm. Think about that and answer your question. We'll get back to another market I'm interested in right now, bonds. I think it's about time for bonds to rally here. Um, you can see the cycle forecast pretty clear, uh, especially we should start to pick off to the upside about the 13th of November to rally in here. And this big area we've seen in bonds, I expect is going to set up another rally coming up in bonds. Short-term traders should be looking for that. These cycle forecasts are done using timing solutions software. By the way, I've been asking questions about that. Uh, you can go to timingsolutions.com uh, if you're interested in doing cycle forecasts yourself. Bond entry ideas, it can be a breakout at the highest high of the last seven or eight days. That would be a trend change. See a higher short-term low, that would be an entry. Or a trend line break to the upside, you can use those three techniques uh, to get into the bond market. Winter's coming. We talked about this a week ago about looking at heating oil. We saw that the commercials have been buying heating oil and in this great big trading range, seasonal patterns start to come up before much longer. My expectations, we're in this area uh, right now in terms of a cycle low, we should move up into at least November 1st and of a pullback and then perhaps another rally to the upside. And here's a follow-up. This is a right up to date version of heating oil. Notice the blue line, that's our measure of momentum, is clearly to the upside now. Uh, while it looks like we've been in a trading range, the momentum has moved to the upside. We've seen pretty good accumulation in here. The market's congested, but we're making higher highs in accumulation. I do want stops, lowest low last five or six days in this market. Other than that, it should move to the upside. Potential targets, this high close we saw in that big uh, explosion that we had in Saudi Arabia. We get up there, take your profits. Okay, we asked the question, what stock was the biggest loser so far in the S&P 500 this year? And hopefully have a winner to that. And the stock is a surprise one, Macy's. Macy's is the biggest loser in 2019, down 48% so far for the year. Hmm, fascinating question, isn't it? Macy's is the big loser. And this is what brings up a really interesting point to me. Uh, here's the what I want to do at Macy's right now, though. Here's our uh, seasonal forecast. It should rally. So it's been beat up like crazy, right? And in a seasonal low point, I would expect this is the time to look to be a buyer of Macy's. Not because it's uh, been beat up. A lot of people will probably cover shorts and get that year-end rally. Uh, just because it's been beat up doesn't mean we want to sell it. Just the opposite of what we saw in Chipotle. Here's the interesting point. The largest winner, CMG, is up 97%. And the two largest losers are Macy's down 48% and KTR down 46%. If you bought the largest winner, equal amounts, uh, say uh, $1,000 uh, in uh, Chipotle, and you bought the largest losers, $1,000 each, uh, $500 in each of those, you would have broken even. Interesting. 
the upside is unlimited is what is this telling us while the downside is limited that's the problem of being a short seller and i love to be a short seller i do sell short but the problem is you're limited you can only go down so much your upside is always unlimited so here we see that the number one stock had a gain equal to the losses in both of the worst stocks so you might want to keep that in mind when it comes to your investing and trading a look at cocoa, we looked at cocoa, we're looking for cocoa to come down in the marketplace, cycle forecast says it should move into the November lows, and that's about what it's been doing. Um, accumulation has fallen apart in the market while price is higher here than here. We've actually made new lows in accumulation, so I still wanna look for short-term sales in this market. Corn and the grains, we talked about corn being a potential sell in the market. Uh, commercials, as you can see, we're in the sell zone down here. And our cycle forecast suggested that we should move to the downside. And here we are. It, this market continues to be under distribution in the market. It continues to be weaker. And here's the seasonal pattern. It starts to move to the downside now. Accumulation is really broken. So I think this is another market. Of course, we always will have stops in the market because I've been wrong. It's not easy to be wrong in this business, that's for sure. What I like to do when I trade is see an example like this, the momentum is to the downside, when percent R gets into the overbought area or any over, overbought or sold indicator, look to be a seller, especially if I have a condition. And our condition here is seasonal pattern starts to move to the downside. The accumulation of the market, well look at this, price is higher here than here, accumulation lower here than here. Price is higher here than back here, Accumulation is lower here than back here. So we really haven't seen a lot of good buying coming into this corn. Doesn't mean it can't. It can. That's why we have protective stops. But as Sir Isaac Newton once said, an object once set in motion tends to stay in motion. It's what's been happening. Distribution of the market most likely will continue happening in the marketplace. So there's another trade that you can look at to be a follow-up uh, in the market. So I want to review the trades that we're interested in. Cocoa, potential short sale. Uh, you can see why for that. Upcoming trades at uh, uh, Macy's on the buy side. And uh, heating oil continuing to the upside. And uh, where is our bond trade? Uh, bond forecast, I think we've got a pretty good move coming up here. So you want to be paying attention to that as well. So those are some trades coming up for you. I noticed some of you have posted uh, comments on the uh, uh, YouTube stuff. That's great. I've replied to some of those. Uh, if you like what you've seen, come learn and trade with me. Uh, Larry Williams at iReallyTrade.com. Uh, I do a weekly market commentary. Or if you don't want to come trade with me, a lot of free stuff. A lot of explanation of the commitment to trade report on our website. And I use that a lot. As you see, I think I have more experience with that than anybody because I'm the first guy to write about it way back in the 1970s. So we explain it, explain it in detail on our website. So there's a lot of stuff there at iReallyTrade.com for you. I will be doing this remember, each week, each Thursday at 1030 uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if you have questions, of course, you can write them. And uh, I look forward to doing more of these next week. Any input you have, I look forward to that because I'm still learning how to be a TV personality. It's not nearly as easy as I thought it was. So until next week, uh, this is Larry Williams wishing you Good luck and good trade.